Welcome to Stuff You Should Know, a production of iHeartRadio. Hey, and welcome to the podcast. I'm Josh, and there's Chuck, and Jerry's here too, and this is Stuff You Should Know, a good old history edition, if you ask me, by goodness. History of the World Part uh, 2. <laughs> I, I I don't think I saw that since I was maybe eight, and at the time I was like, I have no idea what's going on or why people think this is funny. Yeah, well, that was part one. Part two is out now. Oh, really? Yeah, we're not getting paid for this, but I'll plug the heck out of it. It's uh, it's on Hulu, and they waited, you know, it's like a forty year in the making sequel mm-hmm. that they did as a TV show mm-hmm. uh, with Mel Brooks executive producing and narrating. But it's like some of the great. Uh, minds and comedy out there doing, uh, you know, history sketches. Is Michael Fassbender in it? I don't think so. Is he one of the great comedy minds? I think so. <laughs> uh, it's really funny, though, like genuinely laugh out loud funny. Yeah, I got to check it out because those yeah. things are rare and few and far between. Yeah, it's good stuff. You know, sketch, so not everything is perfect, but it's uh, I found myself laughing quite a bit so far. I've seen three of them, I think. OK, it's on Hulu. It's on Hulu. And what what happens if you don't have Hulu? Do you just go subscribe? I, I don't know how you can watch it. I think you just go subscribe to Hulu is what I'm trying to say. Oh, sure. But this is, sounds <laughs> like an ad for Hulu. I don't know about TV shows. You can just go out and buy a show, right? Sure. You, you want. can buy whatever you want. It's the 21st century. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Should we talk about the Bronze Age? Yeah, let's go back a few centuries, a few millennia, actually, to the Bronze Age. Great age. Sure it, it was it was a great age. It was actually the first great age. Um, I think most people are familiar with the term Bronze Age, but they might not know like just how amazing an age it really was. Like just eye poppingly amazing, frankly, if you think of it. Yeah, it, and it was uh, specifically wedged between the Stone Age, mm-hmm. which stones worked great for millions of years for a right. lot of things. Yeah. Uh, bronze came along and then was followed by the Iron Age, where we were plunged into the Dark Ages. Yeah. But we're talking, what, 3300 BCE to about 1200 BCE. Mm-hmm. A little and, over a thousand years. Yeah, and it had a lot to do with bronze, which we'll talk about, but also just advances in almost everything you can think of. Yeah. Art, architecture, politics, diplomacy, technology, religion, yeah. um, warfare. Their version of science. <laughs> Yeah, the early sciences, early astronomy and math, uh-huh. writing, all of this stuff was born during this thousand-year stretch of the Bronze Age. And again, like you might say, well, a thousand years, of course you could invent all that in a thousand years. But think about it. We were around for tens of thousands of years as modern humans and millions of years as hominids of some sort or another up to that point. Mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden, boom, civilization just develops out of nowhere. And it was in large part because of bronze itself. Not just that bronze tools are are way better than stone tools. They're eas- more easily sharpened. You can fashion them more easily. You can recycle mm-hmm. them. So when yeah. they get busted up, you can re-smelt them and make it brand new again. That's a huge advance in technology. Sure. But the actual bronze itself, in a really roundabout but also pretty direct way, wove people together in ways that they never had been before that led to civilization. Yeah. It's really cool how the discovery of metallurgy Mm -hmm. just changed so much in a very, you know, if you look at the big picture, a very short amount of time. Yeah. So there were, if you want to make bronze, you take copper and you take a little bit of tin. It's usually the alloy that makes bronze. You just smash them together with your hands. (laughs) (laughs) You do. Over the course of 15 years and then bam, you have bronze. Um, so you, well, no, you melt them, you smelt them, and uh, he who smelt it dealt it, right? right. That's right. <laughs> and um, you have bronze, and you can fashion it into tools. But to get copper and tin together, you have to go to all sorts of different places in the Mediterranean. You have plenty of copper, say, on Cyprus. That was a copper mining center. But then if you wanted tin, you had to go a couple thousand miles, a few thousand kilometers to the east, if I'm Which not way? mistaken. To the east. <laughs> okay. To Afghanistan, which uh-huh. was a tin center. And to get that that tin and that copper together, you had to create really extensive trade networks. You had to go through one land to another. So you had to make friends or make enemies with those people. Yeah. And all of these new relationships developed just to get the components 
to make bronze together, and that that formed the basis of all the stuff that seemed to follow. Yeah, and uh, and we'll talk about the warring. There was certainly that, but there was also a lot of cooperation because everyone wanted to get their hands on that sweet bronze. Mm-hmm. And they're like, hey, if you want to play with the big fellas, yeah. then maybe become part of this trade route. Uh, allow us to go through your area with the tin or whatever, or, or maybe you have something that we need yeah. other than just, you know, being on the way. But there's a lot of cooperation uh, involved, too. Um, as far as the the bronze, what that led to ultimately was better. And this is the sort of the cascading effect that a simple, not simple, but a discovery like this can have mm-hmm. is uh, or make is uh, better farming techniques. And you might think, well, great. So you could farm better. But that means you could farm bigger, and that means you could support more people, and that means you could get a a civilization going. And because you had – before you previously had a situation where, like, hey, listen, everyone's got to hunt and gather, Mm -hmm. and then later later on everyone's got to farm because we just can't support ourselves unless everyone's kind of in on this. Right. Now they had more sophisticated techniques, so fewer people had to farm to support more people even – Mm-hmm. And that freed up people who were good at other stuff to do other stuff. So that's the cascading effect that you were sort of alluding to where like this one thing led to farming, uh, better farming, but that better farming led to division of labor where it's like, hey, I'm really good at science. Hey, I'm really good. I'm a really good writer. But everyone always said, don't waste your time writing because we need you farming. Right. It's brand new. It might not stick around. It could just be a fad, this writing thing. It might just go away. <laughs> so, yeah, and with that division of labor, the writers can write, the math people can figure out math, the farmers can farm and feed everybody. And then um, one of the other big pillars of support for this division of labor that allowed it to blossom was centralized governments that said, farmers, we're in charge of you. Make right. X amount of grain and bring it to this central place. Everybody else, come to this central place and get your grain. We're taking care of you. We're feeding you so you guys can go off and concentrate on this other stuff and help civilization flourish. So government is a, um, a huge, sweeping, bureaucratic, hierarchical entity um, really got established in the Bronze Age as well just because there were so many people being strung together, again, in the service of creating bronze. Yeah. And hey, while you're at it, enslaved people, why don't you build huge statues of me and mm-hmm. and big uh, monuments of myself as the leader of you? Um, so that's kind of what happened. You know, the, the establishment of government from the very beginning sort of gaveth and tooketh away, mm-hmm. uh, gaveth in that all the things you were saying, which was great about organizing large groups of people. But took it away because every civilization was built on the backs of enslaved people. Um, And if not enslaved, at the very least, uh, they established a a real kind of like never before a real hierarchy of, hi, I'm in charge and you're not. So you don't matter as much. Yeah, that's that was definitely new. I mean, you always had things like, you know, shaman or some sort of like probably group leader or elders or something like that. Right. For hunter gatherer bands, but nothing like this where. Systemic. You, just, you didn't even come close to, to talking to or knowing personally the person who was your your ultimate leader. Like that yeah. was brand new. Um, and what's interesting, Chuck, is you said, you know, kind of for better or for worse about the government um, emerging. You can really see how you feel about uh, today's world by how you interpret what was born and what happened during the Bronze Age. It's like yeah. looking in a a highly polished bronze mirror, basically. (laughs) It's really interesting what reflects back. And it's not always cut and dried. Like, I have certain feelings about, you know, topics like government or whatever, but I also, in looking back a few thousand years, it's also easy to see the other side's opinion because they're not all up in my face. They're several thousand years old, and I can kind of now understand contemporary people's um, feelings Mm -hmm. about, say, government or something as well. I think that's just fascinating. That's Ultimately, why history is so important, because you really do learn lessons from it. You can like yeah. humans are not we like to think we're super advanced compared to, you know, the people of a few thousand years ago. But we're still basically the same humans that we were back during the Bronze Age. And so there is a lot to learn. I agree. Uh, you know, we mentioned that there was warring, obviously, when you're going to get bigger groups of people together and governments ruling those people. 
uh, and they're in close proximity to one another, you know, neighbored right up to, to each other. There's going to be people that don't get along and there is obviously going to be warring. But like we mentioned, there was also a lot of diplomacy mm-hmm. and there was a, a very sort of uh, golden age of this golden age, kind of square in the middle where things were cruising along really, really nicely. Uh, I think these sort of looking back at it, it seems like the beginnings of a big grand um, transition like this, things mm-hmm. can be rough. Mm hmm. And as we'll see at the end, given that it basically collapsed, it's obviously rough. But there was a time in the middle there where things were going pretty great. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. It's that Middle Bronze Age prosperity. And it actually kind of underscores the idea that when you bring a lot of people together, Mm -hmm. you can do amazing, momentous things. But if you bring a lot of diverse people together, you've got a lot of different um attributes, different contributions from different mm-hmm. groups. And opinions. Yeah, and opinions. And um, affluence and prosperity can really follow when people of diverse backgrounds interact with one another on large scales. Amen. That's pretty cool. Should we take a break? Sure. It's kind of an early break, but it feels like a good stopping point. And maybe uh, when we come back, we'll talk about the Big Eight. I tease the big eight. Uh, we're talking about the, the big eight areas, uh, societies that dominated the Bronze Age. And mm-hmm. they are not this is not in order of influence or preference, even it's alphabetical. A, <laughs> it's not any. This is just randomly assimilated. OK. Or assembled. Uh, Egyptians. Mm-hmm. Not bad, actually. Uh, hit. And as we'll see, the Egyptians, they didn't completely go away. They they got punched in the face during the Bronze Age collapse. But yeah. They, they stuck around. Yeah. Uh, Egyptians, Hittites, Canaanites, uh, Cypriots, Minoans, Mycenaeans, Assyrians, and rounding out the top eight, everyone's favorite, the Babylonians. And this is like not all of these groups were dominant at one time at the same time. Yeah. Some were dominant at, at one time or another. Like the Minoans were the civilization that predated the Myce- Mycenaeans, right? Mm-hmm. So um, by quite several hundred years, if not longer, but each one dominated. They both controlled Crete uh, while they were in charge. And if you look at these these groups, too, a lot of them are, I mean, I guess you'd call them famous, like the Babylonians, pretty famous, the Minoans, famous, the, um, the Egyptians, super duper famous. Yeah, way famous. And this was the, this were, these were the groups that created the beginning of history. Like this was the time when the pyramids at Giza were built or when the Epic of Gilgamesh was written and the Code of Hammurabi was encoded. Yeah. Um, this is when Pharaoh's like Tutankhamun and Ramses II ruled. Like this was big deal, capital H history that was being produced at this time. Um, and it seems to have all kind of started with the, um, the, the Sumerians. They seem to be the ones who like started kicked the whole thing off. Yeah. And and we should mention, too, that all of those groups that we named had subgroups, a lot of ites, mm-hmm. Hittites. You want to tell them some ites? Hivites, Amorites, uh, Girgashites. That's my and, favorite. And these were all, all subgroups, and they even had subgroups, you know, under these umbrella terms like Canaanites. But uh, Sumerians, like you said, came first. Um, they said, hey, you like irrigation? What do you think about this canal? Right. Uh, what do you think about this ziggurat? What do you think about writing things down? Yeah. And now we can keep track of inventories and things like that and log books and, and money. Uh, or like you mentioned, the Epic of Gilgamesh. Great read. Uh, yeah, it actually Known is. as the first work of literature. Mm-hmm. Uh, but what you also had because of this invention of writing was other cultures writing. And in, in, a, in a way that sort of helps corroborate what's going on. When you have different cultures writing about things that that track or check uh, check one another, then you sort of get a better picture of what's happening. Well, plus also when you have these diverse cultures that have different systems of writing and language, 
when they communicate with one another, they're often writing in two different languages. Right. So later historians, once you crack one language, you can use that to crack, like, let's say you cracked hieroglyphics. You can use hieroglyphics to now crack linear B, which was, uh, I think, out of Crete, if I'm not mistaken. And if you crack linear B, well, wait a minute, they used linear B to uh, write this cuneiform or cuneiform. So we can right. crack that now, too. So, like, almost all tablets written during this time were in multiple languages. So each one's like a Rosetta Stone. Yeah. It's really neat. That is super cool. Uh, so everything's going great. People are trading. People are thriving. People are farming like never before. And all these advances are happening. And then, boom, almost, for the most part, everything stopped. Uh, most of that development and almost all of those major civilizations kind of just went away. And like we said, the Iron Age came along. Uh, looking now, my friend, I think this would have been the best place for a break. Sure. <laughs> but I screwed that up. So we'll just dive right into what might have happened. Uh, the date of the collapse is generally given as 1167 BCE, but mm -hmm. it's obviously not the kind of thing that happens overnight. Uh, I think it. they generally now agree that it happened over the course of, what, 30 or 40 years? Yeah, I think from about 1200 to 1150, which, I mean, if it's you're living quick. through that, it's 50 years at the time. So it's it a lifetime. Probably a lifetime. Yeah. But looking back historically, it's like the blink of an eye. Yeah, and in a blink of an eye, things like when we talk about collapse, it was it was a pretty stark collapse. Like there was there's evidence of lots of disturbance, lots of upset in that region. And we'll get into everything that happened. I mean, we talked about the warring. People really started warring. And when certain civilizations might have fallen out of power, that created a, a vacuum there where a new civilization would come in. Mm -hmm. And all of these civilizations kind of going away, I believe it was like Sparta and Athens were the next to come along to really kind of kick off the next golden age, right? Yeah, several hundred years later. And in between, there was what you would call a dark age, the Iron Age, which iron is preferable to bronze in some ways and that it, like, uh, um, it, it can be harder, I believe, yeah. but bronze doesn't rust. So people take typically look at the Iron Age, the transition from the Bronze Age, into the Iron Age as a uh, step backward, a dark age. Um, and it came from this this collapse, the, what's called the Late Bronze Age Collapse, where, you know, you said that, that they really started warring and cities were sacked and burned. Cities have been, like, sacked before and burned before, but they were rebuilt during this mm -hmm. age of prosperity. This time, after the Late Bronze Age Collapse from 1200 to 1150, they weren't rebuilt. They were left in ruins and rubble because the civilizations that would have rebuilt them were gone. Their languages were gone. Their writing was gone. Um, in very short time, people couldn't decipher things that had been written 50 or 100 years before. Yeah. It, was, it was just one civilization after another fell it, like dominoes all around the Mediterranean and this, this part of the world that gave the world essentially civilization for the very first time fell into this dark age. And it's, it's, it was such a stark, massive, all-encompassing collapse of the first attempt at civilization that it, it just piqued uh, historians and archaeologists' curiosity from the first time they detected it. And, and they've been seeking to explain exactly what happened ever since. Yeah, and we'll, in a sec, we'll go over some of the causes. But um, after the cause, and there's a lot of debate over what those were, you're, you, we have a civilization or a, a, a group of civilizations that we've talked about being very interconnected and dependent on one another. Mm -hmm. So you said they fell like dominoes. That's going to happen if you have a lot of civilizations trading with one another, depending on one another, mm -hmm. sharing resources with one another. When one goes down, then it becomes unstable for all of them. And, you know, if, if a, civiliza a civilization collapses – those people, it's not like everyone literally is destroyed. Like those people are going to go to the next closest place probably. Mm -hmm. And that overstresses them. And then it's just, uh, like you said, it's, it's just one after the other. This domino effect happens. And it just kind of happened one after the other over this very short time period. Yeah, because remember, this is the first time when people followed a centralized government. And this is where you got your food, right? Yeah. So when that centralized government collapsed, 
you no longer had access to food. And you're like, I'm a mathematician. I have no idea how to grow grain. I'm going to starve to death if somebody doesn't do something. <laughs> you told so, me to do math. Of course you're going to run to the next civilization that still has a central government with grain that they could possibly have. But that yeah. puts a strain on the grain and people start to fight when there's a strain on the grain. That's just how it goes, right? That's a T-shirt waiting to happen. So um, for one of the first people or one of the first theories that came along um, – was posed by an Egyptologist, a French Egyptologist, who coined the term the Sea People. I like that. The Sea People have long been, um, yeah, it sound ominous in this sense, don't they? Yeah, when you capitalize the Sea People. Yeah, (laughs) yeah. They're probably not bringing fruit baskets, you know? No, unfortunately not. They were bringing death and destruction and mayhem, and in much the same way that we today think of like the Vikings would have to to the UK and um, Western Europe. This is a very similar thing where a bunch of raiding pirates made land and just sacked all these civilizations. And so um, they're they're almost hypothetical that we have a pretty good idea that they did exist in some form or another. They're they're written about in uh, Egyptian stele, stela, can't remember how to say that, Um, but inscriptions, let's just say. And they show up in art, too. So we know that they, they happen, but we don't know who these people are. And what extent they they sacked um, the major great city states, and if if they managed to topple all these civilizations, then holy cow, they were they were amazing. But a yeah. lot of people are like, I'm not sure they actually were the trigger. They might have been a symptom. Yeah, and we don't like you said we don't even know for sure who they are. I believe Egyptians did identify some groups of them at the time uh, as like the Ashawasha or the Luka or the Sheklesh. But that means nothing to us these days because (laughs) their contemporary names were lost to history. Right. So uh, what we call a lot of um, civilizations today were named by people who discovered their ruins years later, and that wasn't what they called themselves. Right. Uh, For instance, um, uh, Minoans were named after the Greek king Minos by an archaeologist named Arthur Evans, Mm or Arthur Evans. Mm -hmm. Um, In some cases, we do know what they called themselves. In other cases, we don't. I think uh, the Sumerians, we know, called themselves uh, Ungsang Giga, uh, which is black-headed people. But they were named Sumerians by Akkadians who followed after them. Right. So we have trouble with identifying people because the names were lost. We have trouble identifying people like the Sea People because there's a very murky picture of who was where and when they were there. Right. So there's a lot of different stories where you think like one group of people maybe came in and overpowered another and drove them into oblivion, where it's like, no, now we believe that they were there sort of all along and they just filled that power vacuum or maybe those actually were those people. Right, right. Like for a good example is the Canaanites. For a very long time, the Philistines were blamed, and I mean a really long time, the Philistines were blamed for toppling the Canaanite empire. But um, more recent scholarship says, actually, I think the Canaanites became the Philistines after the collapse. They kind of broke up as a group and then reformed. Like, um, mm, trying to think of a band. <laughs> the only one I can think of is my high school band who broke up and reformed without me. Without- <laughs> so let's just say that. It was like my high school band. Oh, that story just breaks my heart every time I hear it. <laughs> breaks my heart, too. But anyway, um, that's what they think happened. So so a lot of the scholarship that we were we relied on for centuries, like the, the Canaanites were toppled by the Philistines, was, it was incorrect. And we have to figure it out by deducing, well, wait a minute, this group was here at this time and this group was here at that time. The contemporary reports don't actually help us that much because we might be totally familiar with the Sheklesh, right. but we, we call them the, the Mycenaeans. Right, right. But is it the Mycenaeans? Well, let's go and look. The Mycenaeans were toppled by the sea people, so probably not the Mycenaeans. So you have to use this historical deduction to try to figure mm-hmm. out who these people were. But the upshot of it is that now today, and yes, I said upshot, by God, <laughs> I'll say it again. The upshot of it is You're that today drunk. we think the sea people... <laughs> Um, we're basically like pirates of the days of yore or more yeah. recent days of yore. They they weren't from one particular country. They were a loose confederation of people. Exactly. Which, I, I mean, I buy that. That makes sense. Yeah. It makes a lot more sense than some group we are totally unfamiliar with or know by a different name 
but haven't detected went and like just completely toppled every single culture yeah. and civilization in the Mediterranean at the time. Yeah, I agree. Uh, another thing that makes sense, and I'll go ahead and spoil it and say I think all these make sense. Mm-hmm. So I, I've subscribed to the um, – it was probably a little bit of everything. But uh, overextension is a big one. Um, if you are – I mean, th- this was their first foray into this kind of um, mass agriculturalism mm-hmm. and, and, and massive government and these big, big groups of people. And they, you know, it was just, er, it was their first try, uh, humanity's first try at this stuff. So obviously it's going to not go perfectly. And if you're managing that many people, like any government has a limit on how many people, even today, that they can probably manage successfully. Any business does, any friend group does. Uh, So the fact that they just overextended themselves is probably a pretty good factor. Yeah, that's entirely possible. So um, that's another theory just by itself, overextension. And, and once those governments are like, oh, God, I can't support everybody, there's like maybe a revolt or at the very least political instability mm-hmm. and yada, 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 right? And then dominoes. One of the problems with that theory, though, is that we have letters from one group to another, from like the Hittite um, empress to the like Ramses II in Egypt saying like, hey, help, which right. really shows the diplomacy and the interdependence. but. It, they would say things like, hey, help, we're running out of grain. I need some food. Can you please send my people some grain? Mm-hmm. So um, that makes it seem like it it wasn't just overextension, although it could have been overextension that led to it now that I kind of sussed it out. Oh, well, look at that. Yeah, we might just go edit that whole part <laughs> out because it turned out to be totally <laughs> unnecessary. Well, uh, two natural sort of um, disasters came together uh, that that are obviously going to have a, a deleterious effect on civilizations. Very nice. Um, drought and earthquakes. Uh, we do know that um, there's a lot of evidence that there was a drought, um, a seemingly really long one. I think they've, act- you know, have actual proof of fossilized pollen uh, from the bottom of the Sea of Galilee that mm-hmm. said there was at least a 150 year drought. Right. And then other people say no, it was probably more like 300 years. Yeah. And, you know, that's that's going to cause destabilization like nobody's business if your whole like sort of new societies are built on mass agriculture. Uh, people are going to start fighting. They're going to start warring with one another. Uh, I do think it's interesting that uh, along with this theory, they say that the sea people might have been climate refugees from another part of the world. Mm-hmm. Very interesting. Um, and, you know, back to what we said, like the great thing about this mass farming is all of a sudden – it freed up people to do other things with the division of labor. But then when that was stressed, they had to pull people. Like you said, I was I was told I could do math. Um, not that there would be no math, quite the opposite. And they were pulled back from those jobs. So all of a sudden you had an end to other advances because you had to go. You were trying to save your society. Yeah. And that the 2013 study, the one that determined the drought was 150 years long, also said, um, that the end of the drought seems to coincide with the end of that dark age period and the yeah. rebuilding again of civilization. Um, the earthquake thing makes a lot of sense, too. You remember, of course, the horrific um, earthquakes that Turkey suffered in February. Yeah, There was a 7.5 followed nine hours later by a 7.8. And that is just mind-boggling. It killed 46,000 people. The thing is that area, the, this area of the Mediterranean and then the Aegean as well, um, there's f- no less than four major plates that come together in this area. The Arabian, the African, the Anatolian, and the Eurasian plates all kind of converge around here. And so it's known for its earthquakes and also quake storms, which is what Turkey suffered recently. It's like earthquake after earthquake after earthquake, and a lot of them are really, really big. Um, it, there, th- this area is kind of plagued with it and has been for a very long time. And there's plenty of evidence of earthquake damage. Um, lots of poor souls um, being found trapped under their houses and yeah. um, foundations like um, just completely disrupted and uh, walls at weird angles. So that definitely happened around this time. But then there's also other cities that were destroyed where you find like arrowheads embedded into the walls and like people with their heads cut off and stuff right. like that, where it's like an earthquake didn't do that. Some other group of people who attacked the city did that. So. Yeah. It, it this kind of leads us to the to the 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 one you subscribe to, which is uh, everything 
everywhere all at once theory, which is that every like there was basically a multiplier effect where one mm-hmm. disaster happened that triggered other disasters and it just made those disasters worse and worse and worse. And that there was just a, a cascade of, of system failures that, that created this massive collapse. Yeah. And again, going back to what I was saying earlier, it's like this was the first try at this kind of thing. And, um, well, well, we'll get to maybe after the break, we'll talk about lessons we've learned. But, you know, on a, on a first attempt at this, this is a long time ago. There, there's, um, there, there wasn't anything they could lean on in any of their histories right. to try and right the ship. Uh, so it just sort of went the way it went. You know, there was kind of almost no stopping it, I think. So I'll give you another anecdote of mine that kind of exemplifies this. Um, when you and I moved into our first place that we ever bought together, I was installing something or other in the I hot water the pipe. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The little condo, little tiny place. Yep. Um, and <laughs> uh, I broke the hot water pipe at the water supply under the sink behind the too. valve. So there <laughs> yeah. was no way to turn it off. And my response to that was to get up and literally run in a circle going, oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God. <laughs> and Yumi had to run in and figure out what was going on and then run out right. and find the water main and turn it off. Right. <laughs> That's what I imagine, like, some of these rulers did, like, after the first disaster or two. Yeah. St- because they had, no, they had no frame of reference. I had no idea what to do right then. I didn't think, like, water main. Uh, they didn't even know there was a water main at the time. So They that's, had no that's Yumi? Kinda, no, exactly. <laughs> they um, That's kind of the response I imagine them doing. That's pretty funny. And then there's one other one, Chuck. Um, so you know how the Bronze Age led to the Iron Age? Yeah. And the division between the two is basically right there. After the late Bronze Age collapse, you've got the Iron Age almost immediately after it. And there is a uh, um, an idea that in Bronze Age Ireland, which suffered its own collapse later on, um, that it was the availability of iron that mm-hmm. led to the collapse of the Bronze Age, because anybody could go find and work iron into something. You didn't need to have right. tin from over here and copper yeah, over here, yeah, yeah. massive trade networks and people at the top commanding everybody else. You could go out and find it yourself. Yeah. And this theory that in Ireland, at least, and it's possible it applies to the Mediterranean too, um, that the, it democratized it so much that it, it led to political instability and hence that, that same destabilization where one civilization was toppled that led to another and another and another. Boy, I, th- this is the side of history I love more than any other, I think, which is are these just sort of things like this is how the earth was. Mm-hmm. And because you could find something here, it led to this, or you couldn't find something there, it led to this. Right. It's really fascinating to me. Yeah, and also they think that the reason why we're able to find metals relatively close to the, the – um, Earth's surface enough so that we can mine them, and therefore have basically all te- <laughs> all technology um, is because the I think a, a small planetoid um, crashed into Earth, and that's where they think the moon came from. And that when it smashed into Earth, it pushed a lot of that molten metal to the surface where it yeah. cooled and formed and settled, uh, allowing us to come billions of years later and dig it up and create <sighs> civilization from it. It really, like, just makes you think it's all just a crapshoot and we have no control over anything. Sure. That or we're living in a really amazing simulation. Yeah, that's right. And, um, all they're, right. Both, they're both right. <laughs> they both could be right. Is it blue pill or red pill? I can never remember. <laughs> why Why not take both? Yeah. <laughs> all right, man. I'm hip to, I'm hip to that. <laughs> My... Uh, Oh, I don't know if I should tell the story. <laughs> if it's pill-based, <laughs> maybe not. Probably not. All right. So we'll take that break, and we'll come back and talk, uh, like I mentioned earlier, a little bit about the lessons we uh, hopefully have learned from the late Bronze Age collapse. So, Chuck, we were talking about lessons for today um, that you can take from the late Bronze Age collapse. And the the most obvious one is don't globalize. It's a bad move. When you become super interconnected and interdependent on one another, the, a 
problem or a failure in one part of the system leads to uh, just failures throughout the system because everyone's so dependent on one another. And if you kind of peel back the curtain a little bit or scratch the that lotto ticket covering um, off, <laughs> you see that the most of the people who are saying that are probably nativists or anti-globalists to begin with. And that's probably. what I was talking about before, where like you can see us reflected back when we're looking and interpreting what happened back then or the lessons from it. It, it really kind of reflects on what our thoughts and attitudes are today. Yeah. And this isn't, you know, a big pro-globalist rant or anything, mm -hmm. but we do have to kind of look around at a pretty great recent example of a worldwide uh, test put on all of our civilizations, which is uh, the COVID pandemic that happened. Right. Um, you know, this happened all over the world. Everyone was punched in the face. All, you know, societies were punched in the face. And there was no collapse. I mean, everyone got bruised up pretty bad. And I think the whole world suffered uh, economically as we're still seeing the fallout from that stuff today all over the world. Right. Um, but no one collapsed. It's not like, you know, the, the, the UK is now, you know, just a warring society and everyone's like, you can't go there anymore because they collapsed because of COVID. Right. Um, it was a really big test of our globalized world. And there are some very smart people who say like, listen, you can't point to the bronze age collapse and say like that, that could happen again in modern times, because, uh, there's this one economist that you found, uh, Zachary Yost, who was basically like, listen, we're way more wealthy than we were back then. Mm -hmm. We have capital goods like we never had before. And there's a big cushion that affords us uh, mistakes these days um, that they didn't have those mistakes. That's why, like I said, it was it was their first foray into this kind of thing. So they had a very um, narrow edge they were walking to begin with. Right. So they they couldn't afford mistakes. We can afford mistakes these days and still be right. able to take a punch in the face and get back up and continue. He also pointed out that, yeah, they had a division of labor, but our division of labor is global and that, you know, we have a lot of redundancy in our systems too. So, yeah, he's saying, yes, you can make comparisons, but it's definitely not apples to apples because of how far we've come. And from the lessons that we learned from the times where civilization has collapsed and rebuilt and collapsed and rebuilt. The, the other way to, to look at it there's a guy named Eric Klein, who's a professor of ancient Near East studies, um, who also wrote a book called 1167, The Year Civilization Collapsed. Um, so he's a bit of an authority on this. His whole thing is, um, actually, no, we're probably more susceptible to collapse than the Bronze mm -hmm. Age was because we're even more interconnected than we were before. And there's a systems... Um, dynamics term, I believe, called hypo -co hyper coherence, where the the system is so homogenous, all the different parts are so homogenous that when one part and also interconnected, that when one part breaks down, yeah, it, it just spreads really quickly and the whole system breaks down, and you can really kind of look around at the complexity of our world today, like just like look at international banking, mm -hmm. that's just one system. In yeah. the larger, complex, globalized system. So when you take these complex systems and put them together with other systems like trade, stock markets, healthcare, um, and then realize that all those systems make up a, a truly global, ultimately complex system, then you're like, actually, yeah, we're, we're possibly even more susceptible to breaking down than the Bronze Age was. Yeah, which is scary to think about. But like as far as anti-globalists saying like we need to undo this mm – -hmm. That ship has sailed, don't you think? I mean, things are so interconnected and we have such a globalist world that it's you, you can't unwind that clock, I don't think. No, at this point. and if you could, you can, but it would be a really rough, unpopular transition. But then what? You're the you're the odd man out and the rest of the world is, is working together. And what happens if you need help from the rest of the world? How easy is it for you to get that help? There's downsides to, to both globalism and nativism, right? Um, neither one is just shown to be the right way to go. And also, this is a really good point too, Chuck. Um, there's We don't know that collapse is inevitable from complexity. Mm -hmm. We also don't know that it, it's it's you can reach a point of complexity where it's so complex that it actually becomes more stable. We haven't figured this stuff out yet, but it, either one's not inevitable, collapse or success. 
So um, the best thing we can do is just invest in ways to be resilient. Yeah. I mean, I, I think you can even uh, narrow that down to like secessionists mm-hmm. these days mm-hmm. where it's like, good luck with that, man. <laughs> right. Have you really thought this through? Yeah. Or do you just like the idea of giving the finger to the rest of the country? Yeah, for sure. I mean, that's a great question. I'd love to hear it answered, too. Yeah, in like a really thought out way, like here's how that would work exactly. Right. Everybody's yeah. going to wear the same kind of flannel right. shirt. <laughs> it's going to be awesome. Seattle? <laughs> I was thinking more Kansas, the uh, legit oh, okay. flannel shirts. So uh, what else? Well, there's another lesson too, right? Yeah, I mean, I think a, a more hopeful lesson is that like you kind of touched on earlier at the beginning, when when you have diverse groups of people interacting, like what usually has followed is is – affluence and peace. And that is, that's what happened here for a long time as well. Right. Um, even more than just the late Bronze Age, um, after that collapse, uh, I think the um, Phoenicians really kind of rose to power and they were a seafaring people. And mm-hmm. one of the first things they did was start peddling their purple dyes that they were famous for um, around the, the Mediterranean. And they ended up establishing new trade networks with other groups that had survived the collapse and started to rise to power. And so the whole thing began again. It's so funny to think about. It's like everyone's like, what is that? And they're like, it's purple. (laughs) Right. People are going to go wild for this stuff. And new civilizations will be built because people are so wild about this color. Yeah. And it's true. I mean, that was a huge driver of it. Purple dye. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? It is. But but the upshot is, sorry, everybody. Oh, boy. Um, that when we, when we, it almost seems like it's it's just going to happen, whether we like it or not. The more we kind of grow as a people and, and grow techn- technologically and in intelligence, we seek out other people to interact with and trade with and become more prosperous with. And if we do it peacefully, then prosperity follows. That seems to be a huge part of not just the the Bronze Age, but also the what what emerged from the Dark Age that followed after the late Bronze Age collapse. Yeah. It's like a big cycle. But if it is a big cycle, then it makes you nervous because then that means we're due for a collapse at some point. Yeah. Unless yeah. <laughs> we've become so resilient and um, um, a redundant in our system that we are going to avoid a collapse from now on. I don't think right. that's right. I don't think we've reached that yet, but I think it's possible to reach that. Did you touch on any of this in uh, The End of the World with Josh Clark? Um, I don't think so. Don't think so. No, not really. All right. Thank you for that plug, though. Sure. You know, I listened to about half of those. It was too smart for me. B.S. It really was. <laughs> it's not. I was like, You're man, like, this I is can't great. listen to this guy's voice. No, it's not that. Of not. <laughs> uh, what about, there's one more, Chuck, that we have to touch on. It's uh, climate change. It's a big a big deal. It's a, a big enough deal that it's possible it drove the collapse of the, our first attempts at civilization. So there's yeah. not necessarily a lesson of what to do in there, but at the very least, it's like a, hey, pay attention to what's going on. Yeah. And we've seen, you know, when natural disasters happen, large groups of people moving to another place en masse. Uh, I mean, those are sort of uh, more micro examples of the bigger picture that happened back then. But that, that's what happens. Yeah. Cool. And sometimes people stay. Yeah. Some people make it the people who like it really hot and wet. Yeah. Not me. No. <laughs> you like it cold, don't you? Like genuinely. I love the cold weather, but I don't like, you know, six month winters. It's not like I'm sure. have any desire to move to Minnesota no. and endure that stuff. But I do love cold weather. It suits me. That's great. You got anything else? I got nothing else. Well, since Chuck uh, was talking about how cold weather suits him, that triggers the collapse of this episode into the dark age of a listener mail. All right. I'm going to call this, oh boy, crossword puzzle follow-up. This is a very dark age. This is the episode where (laughs) people don't like us even having the most minor of disagreements. I know. I mean, I had people writing in, they were like, you need to get rid of Chuck. (laughs) That smug SOB. (laughs) Crazy. Uh, I was like, geez, I hope I'm not on that set of ice. No, you're not. Of course years. not. Some people uh, just have opinions that are outlandish. <laughs> so here's a couple of uh, a couple of things here from two people. Uh, hey, guys, love the show. I was excited to hear you talk about crosswords. 
Uh, Josh talked about how all crosswords are symmetrical. Uh, and Chuck said today's was not. I thought it was cool because I distinctly remembered the New York Times February 16th, 2023 was not symmetrical. What? Uh, after Chuck and Josh took a second look, Chuck saw he was mistaken. Uh, and the crossword did have symmetry, so the episode was probably recorded on some other day. All of this to say, uh, asymmetric crosswords are very rarely published, but if they are, they likely have some trick or rebus in order to solve it. Uh, we didn't talk about rebuses in the show. No, but you wanted to, right? Did you Did you want to mention that what that is? Yeah, a rebus is something I didn't know about when I started out, which is uh, puts you at a very distinct disadvantage. <laughs> yeah. Because it's when you include multiple letters in a single square. Uh, and, and John Hodgman told me about it, and I was like, well, how are you supposed to know? He said, well, once you know it's a thing, you might be on the lookout if you're like, for sure you know a clue, but it's not fitting. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, how do you even do that on a phone? And there's a little rebus button. Oh, yeah, what I never is it? Knew. Well, it's on like the second keyboard, like the one you go to for uh, numbers mm -hmm. and symbols and things. Yeah, what does it look like? It says Rebus. <laughs> oh, really? I've never noticed that before. Well, it's, it's only when you're doing the crossword. I don't oh, think it okay. just pops up. I gotcha. So anyway, um, th that was from Alec. And then this is uh, from David. And we got a bunch of other people that explained why I was getting tripped up. Uh, because what you were describing was radial symmetry. Okay, uh, yeah, right. Which is rotational symmetry. If you rotate an empty crossword 180 degrees and it looks the same, I was looking at, um, I, I think there are four types of symmetry. Mm -hmm. I was looking at whatever the one is called, maybe it is called mirror symmetry, I don't remember, mm -hmm. where it's the exact same on the left and right. And that's why I was like, no, it's not, I'm looking at it. Uh, so you were describing radial symmetry, and David from Snowy Montreal wrote that, along with a bunch of other people. Yeah. And that helped me feel better that I wasn't crazy. And now I know there are four types of symmetry. Yeah, the one that includes all four types is very pleasing. That's why they call it supersymmetry. Oh, really? No, I just... Oh, okay. Jeez. <laughs> I think so supersymmetry <laughs> has to do with string theory, and I'm not sure. We should do an episode on string theory once. Would you Would you be willing to give it a shot with me? Right after I retire, you can do that one. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Deal. Uh, well, thanks a lot to Smart Alec and Smart David for writing in to let us know what the deal was and why we were miscommunicating and everybody calm down chuck and i love each other don't worry about that and we both love jerry so calm down agree if you want to send us a listener mail you can send it via email to stuff podcast at iheartradio.com stuff you should know is a production of iheartradio for more podcasts my heart radio visit the iheartradio app Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.